Magic is a staple of many fantasy universes, often used to enchant, enrich, and enslave the senses. Sometimes you're born with it, and other times it must be earned. It can come from the soul, and from the study of the ancients. But what if magic became something you were born with? A stigma to hide from the rest of the world. And what if the reasons for this were not simple prejudice? What if it had scarred the land, ruined the people, and forever tainted history? What if it was something dangerous that could creep among your friends and loved ones like a soul-destroying fungus? And what if it could be stolen? Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This week we're going to be visiting Twisting Every Way. So let's start this off with the story. We start off with Emya, who is our main character, and we are unfortunate to attend her at a very dark moment, as the story starts out at her parents' funeral. Now we're not given what actually killed her parents, but it does seem that Emya blames herself in some regard. We're also led to believe that the villagers don't care much for Emya, and she's not exactly upfront with why. Attending the wake after the funeral, many of the villagers will come up and give her some small solace, but it does seem to be mostly forced. It's during this time that Emya finds out that she's been taken in by Kamala, one of the village elders, who she doesn't seem to like very much and the feeling seems to be very mutual. Kamala is not a kind woman. Kamala is a very severe woman, but most of the village also seems to share a lot of this severity. They're not a very wealthy village. In fact, they're poor to the point that wood is considered a scarce luxury item. It's even commented upon by Enya when she first enters Kamala's house that walking around in the dark has become very easy for her because wood is so scarce and candles are so pricey that they just get used to navigating in the dark. What little piece the village knew is almost instantly shattered that night when several of the houses catch fire. Emya tries to run with the other villagers, finding herself in the village square, where she's confronted by a man who seems to have otherworldly powers. These are the kings, and these men promptly take over her village. They also lay down a strange rule, that all the water the villagers get must come from the well situated in front of their new throne room, which was formerly the town hall. Given that Emya is kind of the social outcast, it is left to her to gather water for everybody else. The village isn't large, containing at most about 80 people, but this is still a Herculean task, as most people go through quite a bit of water in a day. This is also brought to the attention of the kings, and the kings instantly become suspicious, so they force Emya to come visit them that evening after she finishes all her chores, at which time they basically force her to admit that she has magic and that's why she can do this absurd amount of work in a single day, and actually just a few hours. Then they basically force her to become their apprentice. It's during this time we learn a little bit about magic. Magic in this world is something that works similar to how one would flex a muscle once you're aware of it, and it takes Emya a little while to get used to it. And it's during her training that she notices a poor wretched man who is always kept around the kings. And at the beginning she refers to him as the shadow. She's not allowed to interact with this man and he's often having coughing fits and acting in a very strange manner that makes him appear to be very very sick if not outright dead. Then comes the day of the traders festival. It's a day when nearby villages send traders in to acquire and dispense things that are necessary for life. The kings order Enya to go out and interact with the other villagers and to attempt to make them talk to her. This seems a strange request as most of the villagers have gone to great lengths since she started her magical apprenticeship to avoid even touching things that she's touched, let alone talking to her. And for her part, Enya has found this to be more of an improvement than how they used to treat her which it's not outright stated, but it seems to have been abuse. After the first night of the festival, Emya is left to practice her magic by the fire, which is crackling always in the throne room of the kings, which has been stated to be a bit of an extravagance in Emya's opinion, since wood is so scarce and rare. While practicing, the shadow finds his way to the fire, and after a little bit of an exchange, Emya is convinced to bring him a cup of water. 
despite being forbidden to speak with him. He tells her that she doesn't want to know what he is, and if he told her, she would probably run away. That night, after the conversation, Emya has a very disturbing dream, which leads her to believe that the villagers aren't just talking to her because they're afraid of her, they're not talking to her because they've been enchanted, which, upon conversing with the shadow, she finds out to be true. The kings then convince her to continue going about and trying to converse with the villagers, and this time when she tries, they start acting more erratically and she can now even feel the magic coming off of them, and it feels rotten, tainted. So she decides to confront the kings and tell them that they need to stop the enchantment, only to discover that the kings are actually siphoning magic off of the shadow when she returns, in a fairly dark and not all too pleasant looking experience. The kings openly admit to doing this, and try to explain it away by saying the shadow was a former mage who hunted other mages, and they siphon their magic from him because he was apparently an evil person, though they have no inherent magic of their own like Emya does. Emya suddenly finds herself frightened of these men, but decides to play along, until she gets a moment to talk with the shadow again. She's not quite sure who to trust, but has dark suspicions that these kings might be intending to use her much like the shadow. And this is where I'm going to leave off on the recap, because it's at this point where things start to get rather interesting. Now here's where I want to talk about the characters. I'm really only going to touch on one, and that's Emya. As the kings are present, but they're not as present. Everything is told from Emya's perspective, and Emya has a very reserved demeanor from years of abuse from various people around her. She doesn't know who to trust, and it's very easy to see why. She also doesn't have very high expectations for the future. She's even stated herself in the book that she saw her life where she would take care of her parents until they grew old and died, and then she would lead a nice isolated life, hoping that the villagers would have seen her as not a threat and would at best leave her alone. She's very scarred emotionally and is very slow to trust people later in the book, and it's not hard to see why. She has not up to this point really had many good examples, and most people, if they don't outright ignore her, treat her with deliberate hostility, with a few exceptions. Now let's talk a little bit about the world itself. I do like the magic system, this is a very soft magic system it feels. It feels a lot more like old European magic, where it's dark, it's kind of dangerous, and it seems to be fairly life-threatening. But as the book goes on, we appear to be moving closer to a possible hard magic system. This being a novella, not a great amount of time is spent explaining the magic system, and that's probably for the best. For a system like this, it's nice to have a little bit of mystery, though I get the feeling that the system itself will be explained in more depth later. Without giving too many spoilers away, it is later explained that one of the reasons magic is feared is because it's basically already destroyed the world once, and they are now living in the post-apocalyptic ruins of once great civilizations. This is not uncommon for a fantasy novel, but I do like it when it has a much closer perspective, a much tighter focus. It's also not 100% clear who we should trust in the story. By the end of the book, there does feel like there's more of a basis for trusting some of the other characters, but I do get the feeling there might be a bit more to what's going on later on. If I'm not giving as much detail as I would normally give, that's because the book is very short, and there's a lot that could be spoiled for the story, and it's an enjoyable read. I finished the whole story in about three hours. That being said, if you're looking for an interesting story to spend an afternoon on, you certainly wouldn't regret twisting every way. And with that, I will leave you to your readings. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this review, you can help grow the channel by liking, sharing, and subscribing. If you are an independent author and would potentially like a review of your book, please follow the link below for my master list. If you are interested in my own work and would like to support me more directly, you can find a link to my own works in the description. Thank you.